start with question number one, Mr. Allen. What do you see as the most pressing economical challenge we have in the 12th district, and how will you address it? The problem we have in the 12th district is not unlike the problem we have across the entire nation, and uh, that's uh, Washington and uh, the inept fiscal responsibility of those who we have in the past elected to service, both in the Congress and uh, both in the executive branch. This deficit that y'all that we have is creating uh, uncertainty. Uh, we're pumping four trillion dollars into this economy. We've already pumped four trillion dollars into this economy. You've never done that before. We don't know what the result of that is. So like me, I'm a small business person. I created jobs, I balanced budget, I only had one deficit here in 37 years of business. And that's because the company went bankrupt and owed us over a million dollars. We still paid our bills and we got through it. But I'm telling you, every small business person in the 12th district is thinking the same thing I'm thinking is do we take continued risk when this government is totally out of control? We must restore fiscal responsibility in Washington. I've done that in my business, I've done it 37 years, and I have a proven track record. Thank you. I'll say that one of the, large, one of the biggest concerns I have is you don't see people 40 and younger starting businesses in this country, much less in 12 districts. If they are running a business, they're trying to maintain it. And the concerns that we all have are where the country is headed with the national debt, with the spending problems that we're seeing, with the government regulations that we're seeing across the board. We have government control and education and health care now, and now we're losing the private sector. And we, we have no representation in our elected offices because people are too busy trying to maintain that office after being elected. Instead of doing what they know is right and following the, the foundation of this country is found on. And I truly believe that if we will get the regulations out of the way and get back to the foundation that this country has stood for, we can address the issues that we have in the 12th district, not to mention the rest of the country. But I've said it many times that I don't feel like we can solve the problems unless we strengthen our state legislatures. And the lack of focus that we have in that, and we're allowing the national government to dictate policy that we allow to trickle down, we're not seeing the exercise of the rights of the state, the sovereign right of the states. So until we strengthen that, we're going to see this constant erosion. The biggest challenge is an out of control federal government and a Republican Party with leadership that won't stand up and stop. Uh, I don't know how many of you noticed in the news this week that at the tail end of last week, our current speaker, John Boehner, called for a voice vote in the House of Representatives. That means none of our current members of the House have their vote recorded to increase the deficit and do a repair job on Obamacare in the same vote. That was hidden from the public record until after the vote was taken. As long as we've got leadership like that, we're not going to be capable of attacking this federal deficit. The out of control spending is going to bankrupt this country, destroy our jobs, ruin our children and grandchildren's future. We've got to have leadership that will stand up. That's why I became the first House candidate in America to sign the Republican Trust Pledge. So if I'm elected, I'm going to vote out the entire House leadership we have now and replace them with true conservatives that will stand up for our Constitution, stand up against the Obama administration and Obamacare, put in a balanced budget and fight again. Until we have that while we have the kind of leadership that we do in Washington right now that caves in with that shameful voice vote last week, we can't address the problem. That's the problem right there. Thank you. Well, I agree with the others. It's the federal government. You know, there should have been a deepening of Savannah Harbor. That's been in the process for over 10 years. That should have been done long ago. John Barrow had Savannah in the district up until 2010. His being over that area it didn't matter. The federal government still ignored the will, wishes of the people. Progress is being hampered. And we really have to look to the United Nations and we have to look to something called the Junior 21. And the
things that uh, they want as far as no, uh, no growth within the United States property. You look at their map and you see we're starting to conform to the map of the Agenda 21. So that involves our president fighting over 900 executive orders. Uh, Bush only wrote less than 100 for his eight years, and we've already got over 900 from Obama and his ours, and they're all people that something called June 21. I call it the Communist Manifesto of 1992. So if you're not familiar with it, please look it up. There's a lot of that on the internet. But until we remove the Democratic Party leadership, and I call for your impeachment now, we will be stuck in this morass of no growth and no jobs, and that's on purpose. We all know that the Don F. Kennedy said once before, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for the country. That is the fact that the Democrat. Now, today, our society, too many people try to look for the government to do, do something for them. We must change those that I hear about. In Washington, they are completely out of common sense. And if we continue that, that things going, then we're going to be in the cliff. Washington is a U-turn. We must tell the folks that enough is enough. They cannot spend more than what we get. This our war exercise. I am the pure American dream. If I can do it, they can do it. Everybody can do it. I came to this country with nothing. I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. There was one point I didn't even speak English. But here I am. I'm going to give you a song. If people don't understand, if I can do it, then they can do it. And we still have hope. Thank you. With our next question, we will begin with Mr. Dutton. Where do you stand regarding immigration, and how will you address this issue? I have never been in Monroe. I have a brand uh, We have to completely forget about even, even considering that. The first thing that we have to do is lock down the border. And, and whatever, whatever it takes, we have the strongest military in world history, but the weakest borders in the world. So the first thing before we can talk about a comprehensive approach to what to do with those that are here illegally, we have to make sure that we lock that down. And especially to the satisfaction of the border states and what we're seeing that they're having to deal with on a daily basis. Can't I even imagine. But um, as far as you know, once we're in that position, then we can have an approach of, of how we address those that are here illegally. And, and I think that that's, that's the first thing that, uh, that we're going to have to address. And it's, it's, it's absolutely alarming that we, we see what we're having on the worst day right now. To start with something against amnesty, and I'm sure we'll story behind that. Back when I worked for Congressman Norwood, uh, he served on the House Immigration Reform Caucus, and this was back in 2005, the first year that the Minutemen went to the war. The Immigration Reform Caucus asked us, uh, myself and a retired Marine colonel, go to the war, don't tell the war patrol you're coming, and see what's going on on the ground and report back to us so we'll know what's actually happening without it being filtered through the media and through the administration. Uh, we did sail on the border for a week, crossed multiple times back and forth in Mexico just to see how easy it would be. Uh, when I worked for Congressman Carter in 2010, we did a return trip and went down to Sarri and Laredo and drove a thousand miles up the border to El Paso. And uh, my wife never was cheap, but she still had to give me for that. Uh, and talked to our sheriffs, our border, our border patrol, our landowners about what we need to do. And what I did when I came back is I wrote a piece of legislation, two pieces, for Congressman Carter. Uh, one that allows our board governors to call for their National Guard at federal expense and shut the war down once and for all. Because we cannot rely on the Obama administration to do it. Our governors can. 
Secondly, to provide the resources to our border sheriffs if they need to shut down. When we do that, we need to then enact uh, nationwide E-Verify to shut down the draw of illegal jobs and no amnesty. Those are the steps we need. I've already written two pieces of legislation to accomplish it. Thank you, Mr. Stills. Thank you. Well, after you look at the county's manifesto on agenda 21, you'll understand that they want local government, and that means no borders. So, of course, it's, you don't enforce borders. It's not in your DNA, and that's what you believe. We're dealing with people in control of this country that that's in their DNA. That's what they believe. They'll never enforce a local border. We have to remove them. Then we can enforce the borders. Now, I do believe that uh, we have let a lot of people into this country, and uh, I know there are motels that advertise on the border, come here and have your baby so that they'll be an American citizen and so people cross the border just to have a baby. We let that happen. So we have some obligation to those people, I believe, as far as these anchor babies and their families. That needs to be looked at and we need to uh, remove that images for them to come across the border to have that baby. That would be me, me dropping the first sentence, I believe the 14th Amendment. And we could have that. But in the end, I'm definitely for enforcing the border. And no amnesty. As an immigrant, by the way, I came to this country illegally. I am totally against the amnesty because that is an insult to the person like me or my family. Because we stand in line. They have to stand in line. This is a not banana republic. This is the United States of America. <laughs> and Democrat and some Republicans thinking about giving amnesty, giving citizenship. Come on. Are they out of their mind? You can't just give citizenship away. They have the money. They have the money because they love this country. If they don't want it, if they don't want it, they don't, we are not part of it. By the way, we have some illegal immigrants coming from the southern border, but we also have a lot of folks coming to this country with a, with a legal visa to come in, but guess what? They won't the stay, they, they don't want to go back. I think we as a government, as in other countries, they need to take care of your citizens' responsibility. We cannot take care of all ourselves. We need an America, we need to speak up to the other country. They need to start taking care of their people. Just like when we go to other country, they ask the American to take care of American citizens. So we must be taking care of this immigration law once for all. Thank you. And well, one of the reasons I want to go to Washington and is that this has been talked about since I can remember. And there's nothing been done about it. I have learned a lot about immigration. Uh, I learned about it in what happened in the 50s. I, I learned when we, when we came across in 1965. I was in Honduras a few years ago with my daughter on a mission trip, and uh, I did not speak Spanish, and a gentleman walked up, and he said, what's your problem? I said, well, we're trying to find everything we need here for country floor, a cardboard house. He spoke perfect English. He said he came to this country, Worked up here 20 years, and all the money toured me. He took me on a tour of his home down there. And I said, so you came to America to work, and then you went back home? He said, oh, yeah. Never did no stay on there. We closed that border, and what I learned is we closed that border. You know, they don't trust our banking system. They're going home. Until we seal the border. I mean, there's not really a lot of debate on this issue. And if we can track a FedEx package from Paris, France, to Dublin, Georgia, why in the world can we sell our border? Thank you. Power, speed, maneuverability, and reliability are just some of the things that make a championship race car. They're also some of the things that make one of the nation's best lawnmowers. I always expect high performance on the racetrack, and it's no different when it comes to high performance on my lawn. Hi, I'm Richard Petty.
Visit your local Gravely dealer today. Gravely Lawn Mowers are the only mowers allowed at Petty's Garage. Hey, I'm Dale Nifong, your State Farm agent on Hillcrest. All of us here can provide you with whatever you need from an insurance standpoint. Auto, health, life, homeowners insurance, and even financial services. Check us out at our new location on Hillcrest Parkway between Dublin High School and Kroger. Get the best deal on your auto loan from First Lawrence Bank. Make it easy to get that loan you need. See the professionals at First Lawrence Bank. Loan officers Ben Bradshaw, Linda Evans, Stanley Souls, or Pam Graham for the best deal on a car loan. When you need a car loan, think First Lawrence Bank. And make it easy. First Lawrence Bank, Dublin, and Dexter. My parents are really slowing down. I feel bad I can't always be there for them. How do I choose between caring for my mother and caring for my own family? I've been looking into the options, but Dad doesn't want to leave his home. What do I do? Struggling to care for an aging parent? You're not alone. Learn how Home Instead Senior Care can provide the personalized in-home care your loved one needs. Home Instead. To us, it's personal. What do you see as the federal government's role in education policy and how can the government best support our nation's public school teachers? The federal government's best role in public education would be to block grant every nickel of federal money we're currently spending back to the states, shut down the U.S. Department of Education, and turn education back over to our state of education. I'll tell you, this is one of which I have a sharp difference with current Republican leadership and with a lot of other folks out there. We keep making the same mistake over and over. We made it with the first President Bush with uh, uh, Goals 2000. That was going to be a wonderful Republican reform of public education. It turned into a great Democrat boondoggle, uh, destroying our system and bringing us things like uh, elementary school books have their hands too much. So we finally got that thing off the books, and what do we do? We pass No Child Left Behind, which is the same thing, rehash again. We have our current leadership, including members of the Chamber of Commerce, saying we need to get more involved in federal education and start telling our schools what to teach in high school. I say, get the federal government out of public education. It's not included in the Constitution. It's a violation of our constitutional rights. And if we're ever going to go back, as Congress once did, the House did repeal the U.S. Department of Education, but we didn't get it done in the Senate. If we're going to do that again, we've got to have new, true, conservative leadership in the House that will let us do it. That's why I made that pledge and made everybody in D.C. so mad at me. Thank you. The federal government needs to be responsible for dumbing down our educational system really since the 70s. They really altered the educational system and, and at the college level. I wonder why as a teacher, nurse, and I saw all those uh, education students getting those high sigma cum laude awards and high things because they were just really a dumb down their program. But we've lost about 30 years of, of uh, history being taught to the uh, college level, and now they want to uh, those teachers took over the social studies with the history teachers tonight, who were retiring. Uh, when they left, those social studies teachers had been uh, first in socialism at the college level. So unfortunately, they ended the school system, and now they're on the Common Core. And the Common Core is nothing more than bringing the socialist content down to your uh, grade school. So in the event, I believe in as Mr. Jones does, if you get rid of the Department of Education, you keep that money here in the states, and you let the parents and the state work on education and keep the involvement of the federal government out. Thank you. I believe in America. We owe it to our children, your children. Dear children, preserve this great nation. I was having the first new grandson, April 1st. Education is very important. As education is our future. This nation's future. I wish, I want the federal government to stay out of our education system. They need to give back to the power, back to the state and the local with the parents. 
We as a parent, we know our children what is their, their best and their interest of what they can do. So my stand is that the federal government completely get out of our education system that they give the power to the, the state and the local and the parent. Thank you very much. The federal government uh, has managed to uh, completely not only confuse teachers, but administrators, and others in the education system on maybe what to teach and the basic standards of what's, what to teach. Uh, you know, frankly, uh, as far as education is concerned, why do we send a dollar to Washington, get 25 cents to act, and with all these regulations attached to it, our teachers don't have time to teach because they're spending so much time trying to satisfy the federal government and the requirements of getting that money. We need to keep our dollars here local. My mom and dad were educators. Now, my dad's passion was farming, and I grew up on that farm, but uh, dad became an educator. And I listened to the kitchen table for about 18 years, and then talk about how to solve the problems with education. And, you know, we have great teachers. We just need to let them teach. We have a school here in Augusta that I was privileged to be a part of, called the Heritage School. It's a miracle, y'all. We take the losers in the public school system, and they come to the school, and they become winners. That's what education needs to look like. I've been a part of that, and I, I want to be a part of it in Washington. Thank you. The best way they can support public schools is to get out of the way. Uh, I completely agree with this man and this thing. A uh, firm stance that I have with this family, the Federal Department of Education. My wife is a first grade public school teacher, and what I'm constantly reminded of every day is the standards that they have to teach to. They're not allowed to teach the children in the classroom the way they feel it needs to be. Bryson, our, our six year old, comes home, and my wife has to take time to teach him what she feels like he needs to learn because he's not getting it. Not because of the fault of the teacher. And not to the fault of the school system, but to the fault of the standards that are being forced to, to teach the children. And the concern I have is it takes two generations to change anything. And currently, right now in this country, we have two generations that we allow to go through thinking that government is salvation and that government is the answer, that they're entitled to everything. And that if the parents won't do it, the government will. And if we lose this last, if we lose this current generation coming through, we're going to lose the country that we've all hold near and dear. So the first thing we have to do is get the federal government out of the way of educating our children and allow us to go back to where we started in this country and allow people that we trust to educate our children the way that they feel safe. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. From 1940, until 1970, entitlement spending was less than 30% of federal spending. Recently, it is approaching 70%. This is the portion of the question that I will repeat. What policies will you implement to create a sustainable way to provide for the least of us without destroying our children's future? This is a very difficult question because this, this has been coming for years, our, our Federal government has been fostering this type of behavior, dependency on them. Really, I, I'm not going to get the LBJ. But uh, living off of the government is now seen to be okay. Uh, living in, in government housing on top of each other is difficult, but uh, it seemed, seemed to be okay. We've got a major, major problem. We have people that don't know anything else, and their educational system hasn't prepared them for anything else. So we need to really revamp and wean people off of government support. And we need education that will, will really effectively prepare them realistically for jobs, and we need to have those jobs ready. We don't have jobs available now. The kids are dropping out of school at a high rate and turning to drugs because they're bored. I call it prison prep. I don't call it college prep in high school anymore. 
So we have a major, major problem in our educational system. And we have to revise that and change that. And we can get people we need to talk to the government. Thank you. First of all, I approach with the common sense. The common sense tells me that any the government, if they get involved with our personal life, as you know that we, the government, get bigger and bigger and bigger, never, never stop. First of all, we need to cut all this unnecessary government bureaucracy, such as education, energy, commerce, EPA, along those four departments, cost us $186 billion a year. If we can save that money, we can turn around that to the, our children of the future. This may be a little bit off the subject, but I was watching that the other day, that the one day he was uh, having five children. Three different fathers. Tax free. See, making $144,000 a year. We cannot continue to let that things happen to our society. We must give education to those people to be better themselves. They can do for the people, they can do for the country. Charlie Noble was a dear friend of mine. I asked for Charlie from the beginning. And what's significant about that is in 1994, when Charlie Noble went to the United States Congress, about 1996, we had welfare reform, and we had uh, balanced the budget except for the, uh, you know, the unfunded mandates in front of us. Some people say, well, you know, it wasn't that long ago, folks, that we did that. And like I said, this just takes a little common sense. You got to have more people pull up the wagon than you got in the wagon. And uh, that, that seems to be our issue right now. I can tell you this, uh, in the stimulus pack of 2009, which Thompson Barrett voted for, it, every tr uh, transformation we made in welfare to get people back to work, uh, it, it reversed every one of those transitions. So now we got 48 million people on nutrition programs. We got 92 million people sitting at home. We got to get people back to work. We got to remove all the restrictions to this economy. That will also make sure that Social Security is there for our seniors who have paid into this system. And then we've also got to be able to help here. We must uh, get rid of Obamacare and come up with a solution that is not only efficient, but restores the relationship between the doctor and the First of all, I don't believe government's the answer. Um, for so far too long in this country, we, we try to allow government to take over anything that we don't want to do ourselves. And if you go back to any, any problem you face, you have to go back where you started and figure out where you went wrong. And if you look at history, the, the problem that we have in this country is the same thing we saw in Rome and the collapse of Rome. We saw the the government tried to win the people over, win the poor over, win the uh, oppressed over, instead of allowing the Christian movement to take hold, because the, the Christian movement were taking the poor and raising them up, teaching them, and helping them be on their feet while ministering the Lord of Christ. And Rome took over that role, and what you saw was refugees from outside of Rome come in and saw the collapse of that country. We're doing the same thing in this country. We have the weakest border of people coming in here and gaming the system. Government can't do it. It's going to take the citizens of this country, the Christians in this country, to help the people that, that need the help and to get government completely out of that business. And the concern that I have is it's going to have to happen on the federal level because of what we've seen in the state legislature. We work on legislation to correct this, to try to address this. And, and we saw a report. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Well, the answer to this is pretty much the same as this on education, health care, and everything. We need to get the federal government out of the way of the private sector. It's 
start building jobs in the economy again. We have a very fundamental, foundational problem right now in the country, and that in so many states around the country, welfare pays more than starting jobs. Now, that is a huge problem that we've got to address. Specifically, we need to freeze welfare benefits for 10 years while allowing the private sector economy a chance to gain back up and, and, and raise wages until suddenly we're in a position that work pays substantially more than welfare. If we do that, we'll start moving some people off of welfare and on the work and creating jobs and paying taxes again. Nationally, we have to do that. The Social Security situation we've got, we've got to address that in a reasonable way that doesn't cut people's benefits and doesn't raise taxes. Uh, we have people in Washington now that are willing to work on that on both sides of the aisle when we come up with something reasonable. But what we have to do also is start building this district's economy again. When John Barrow took office in 2004, we were slated to receive two new interstates for this district that would greatly stimulate the economy across our entire district. New nuclear reactors. We have a congressman who's let that die on the line that we had broad bipartisan support for both. We need to stimulate the national economy by getting the federal government out of the way. We need to stimulate the local economy as well. No matter where you live in Middle Georgia, Lawrence County's oldest and most reliable heating and cooling company is just a phone call away. And right now, Middle Georgia Mechanical will service your system for only $69.95. And this includes up to one pound of Freon. Call Middle Georgia Mechanical today before that old unit lets you down. Call the best qualified, best trained, and most experienced in the repair and maintenance of your heating and cooling system. Call Middle Georgia Mechanical right now at 275-4530 or any of these numbers and have your system serviced today for only $69.95. Middle Georgia Mechanical, Central Drive, East Dublin. the feeling you get with great service, low rates, and good neighbors meet. Experience it at Morris Bank. Morris Bank. It pays to go blue. service, low rates, and good neighbors meet. Experience it at Morris Bank. Morris Bank. It pays to go blue. What is your position on tort reform? Tort reform. That's a good question. Just like in Obamacare. You know we all have that is a bad program. Within that, we must reform the completely that tort system because the, the doctor, they have so much that they go through the different uh, liability and this and that. They worry about maybe somebody, maybe some patient, maybe soon. They have so many that, that it costs so much for the doing, doing business and as a practicing the doctor. And not only the medical field, but it is overall, we, we somehow think that this, the, this legal system is completely out of control. It does the, the business, as I, I had a small business myself in the last 20 some years. Here I am, I'm trying to work you on, trying to make the payroll, and I'm trying to make the company, but yet I have to follow all this unnecessary well, sometimes it's necessary, but we know how to be taking care of our employee, such as we worry about the EPA and the, the OSHA and all this regulation has to have the regulation. So we must have to reform this as a toll system. Well, for all my attorney friends out there, I want to tell you, we've got the greatest justice system in the world. And I want to thank you for that. It's not perfect. 
but it works, and I found it worked hard on it. But we got some problems uh, in this economy, and part of that problem is uh, is tort reform. You know, this president said he was going to reduce the cost of health care. The only way to reduce the cost of health care is to give the doctors the opportunity to practice medicine again. Right now, because of the legal aspects of practicing medicine, these doctors have to, have to order multiple tests so that they don't have to pay enormous sums for malpractice insurance, which they're already paying, by the way. I was down in Texas recently with some friends down there. I want to see how things work in Texas. You know, Texas has implemented a lot of tort reform. And uh, every insurance company in the country is playing in Texas. Uh, I asked about the health insurance premium. They said, no, they haven't really gone up in Texas. And you see what the business environment is down there. If the tort reform works, we need to work on it. We need to come to some mutual agreement on it. Yes, consumers need to be protected. The patients need to be protected. But y'all, let's just use good old common sense. Yeah, that was a question. Are there any attorneys in the room? Um, every time I've heard this brought up, it's, it's always different opinions in the legal profession. And the, the biggest thing that I see is instead of the, the tour from I agree, we have to come to an agreement on that. And that's, that's the challenge, especially when you're talking about being in a group of 435 where the largest makeup or attorneys have different opinions on this. But the problem we have is government control in the healthcare profession right now. You cannot, we're going to lose our independent doctors. It's going to be a, a pointless discussion to talk about total reform in the next three years if affordable care is saved around. Because you'll have an entirely, uh, an entire system built on government control of health care and what you want to have is salary-based doctors, independent doctors be a thing in the past. So the first thing we have to do before we can ever try to get the attorneys in line to agree on total reform, reform is to get rid of government control of health care. And we have to cut off any form of implementation of long care, affordable care in this country. And we have to do it again. We have to go back to where we started and get the government out of the way and allow the innovation and allow the independent doctors to do what they know is right in the healthcare profession. They need to work uh, Most of our tort reform measures that have been successful have occurred at the state level, as Rick was mentioned about Texas. A lot of states around the country have enacted tort reforms there because most of our tort laws are state laws. Uh, where we really need the reform at the federal level is in addressing unlimited punitive damages. That's the biggest cost driver for the healthcare profession in trying to determine reasonable uh, malpractice insurance rates. It's a driver for most of our other industries in which you can factor how much of a premium should be to cover uh, tort uh, losses if you have compensatory damages to pay back the amount that's been lost through whatever accident occurred. Uh, but what's the unknown factor is that $4 billion for spilling a, hot, a cup of hot coffee in your life. How do you factor that into premiums? How do you factor in massive unlimited punitive damages? And there's where we need to focus our federal efforts uh, in uh, accomplishing that. Several years back, we came very close in Congress to coming through with a bipartisan agreement. I think the Democrats had set $1 million on punitive damage caps. Uh, the Republican side held out for half a million and no deal was reached. But we know there is a deal that can be done. And that's one of the biggest factors involved in driving down health care costs, premiums across the board, is addressing those unlimited punitive damages where there's no way that business and industry or health care professionals can factor for that. Uh, that's an area we need to Thank you. Well, ever since I entered, uh, I practiced the nurse team and graduated from the work from the University of Nebraska. We need a tour of the world. Why haven't we had it? Why have doctors had to do all of this defensive medicine, all the traffic costs are due to doing defensive medicine? You have to wonder what was the rationale for no tour of the world? Was it the, the lobbyists for the uh, attorneys? Or was it because they wanted to remove the property of the physicians? 
In the event, we're now faced with a new situation, Obamacare. And the physicians that I know, they don't like the fact that uh, the government's going to tell them how much they can charge, and the fact that they went to school for so many years, uh, different specialties, they're all going to get paid alike, and so, so on eventually. So most of your physicians are looking for an exit strategy and planning on that. And looking to the ones that have already retired and said, well, why did you know uh, that you should get out then? How did you know? So we are in a dire situation where the government wants control over us, and the best way to do it is through health care. And uh, so in the event, uh, this, is, this argument would be good if we got rid of our current leadership, which I'm all for. Thank you. With the recent spotlight on medical marijuana in Georgia, what is your position regarding this issue? The medical part of the marijuana is uh, very different than the drug itself. Um, you know, from a medical standpoint, I think we need to use whatever uh, whatever drug we need uh, to help us with uh, various illnesses. The one thing that I'm totally against is the legalization of marijuana. And let me tell you why. If you think we got 92 million people sitting at home right now, you wait till we legalize marijuana. Who knows how many people we're gonna be we're gonna have sitting at home? And the reason for that is we drug test in our company, and the reason we drug test is because it reduced our workers' compensation premiums drastically. We have a 0.7 mod rate because of that. Y'all, there won't be any working uh, folks in this country if we legalize this drug. That's my position, again, medically. Uh, you know, I, I don't want the medical thing to lead to legalization, and I think that's, you know, I think from what the physicians tell me is that the drug itself is used for medical purposes does not contain the same elements that are in the uh, drug used for uh, uh, purposes of social in Europe. Well, there's a communication problem to start with on this issue. Under no circumstances should we legalize marijuana in this state. You can go to Colorado if you want to see the damage that it does or just sit back and watch. But what we face in this state and what we need to address in the state was actually the oil that's taken out in the laboratory used for children that are basically to have problems with seizures. And we took that issue up in the Georgia legislature and tried to get that passed to allow those families to have that tool in place. But it had nothing to do with actual marijuana. It was medical cannabis oil. And the communication problem we have is it's, the media has run with it saying it's medical marijuana. So, you know, we, we definitely need to try to provide that option for these parents that are having to face to, to uproot their families and move to Colorado or move to other states that are allowing that, that oil to be used in that, in that manner. So, uh, under no means do we need to uh, legalize marijuana in the city. In Georgia, the medical marijuana issue is a medical issue, but that's not the main problem we're looking at here. This goes to the heart of what's wrong with our country right now and our biggest challenge. We have an administration that has decided it's not going to enforce drug laws anymore, selectively, wherever it pleases. We have state after state legalizing marijuana. Under current federal law, that is illegal. And we have an Obama administration that, just like on the issue of illegal immigration, has decided they'll use prosecutorial discretion to say, we're just not going to enforce the law. We'll enforce the laws we like. We'll refuse to enforce the laws we don't. And they basically overturned the laws of the United States and the ability of Congress to do its job and simply blow past our current drug laws. Now, our problem is we don't have leadership that will stand up for that. We have an administration on the verge of becoming a dictatorship in which our own House leadership won't stand against it. They'll complain, they'll hold news conference, and then the issue goes away and we've got legalized marijuana in spite of Congress voting to block that and that being against the law. There's the issue with legalization of marijuana. We need a Congress that will stand up for our current laws. And to do that, we've got to have leadership that will stand up to the administration. That's why I made that pledge. Thank you. Well, having witnessed children have intractable seizures, anything that will help them, 
I am the one. So I had to leave the for the medical marijuana. And particularly it was going to be a health and a well-based product. It was going to be taken by now. So in the event, the illegal drug trade, I witnessed it. And in the event, uh, it is, as Mr. Stone said, our laws will be enforced. You know, when China became a communist, heroin use went up. Heroin would make the person more satisfied with living in circumstances, make them more happy at just farming a little piece of, of field, and change their perspective so they weren't unhappy with the situation created by their uh, authoritarian government. So that's been a technique for uh, many years to help people adjust to an authoritarian government and uh, allow them these illegal drugs to take over. So I'm against uh, legalization, but definitely anything that would help a child. As a former law enforcement officer, I've always had a problem with any kind of drug, marijuana or anything else. However, the federal law has prohibited for the marijuana to be illegal. But yet, our current administrator, they want to pick and choose which one law they want to pass. They don't want to, like a very court, but we don't want to enforce. These people are just completely out of the line. And the law is a law. You can't just pick and choose which one that, that law you want to enforce or which law they don't want, they don't want to enforce. However, if they're talking about the medical use only, Here's again, you gotta remember, this Democrat or liberal, they always want to just a little bit at a time. So, when we decide to give a little bit at a time, before you know, they ask for a whole body. So, I am really have a problem with that given the legalization of the marijuana. Period. Thank you. I want a lot. Oh yeah. I want a career that makes a difference. I want an education that I can afford. I want to come out of college trained for a good paying job that actually exists. And I want help landing that job. So, I'm attending Oconee Fall Line Technical College. What do you want? When you choose OFTC, it makes a difference. Oh, hey, you got one of those insurance apps, too? You know how this thing works? No, I'm sorry. Not an app. It's my agent. In this moment... No, I'm fine. Thanks. It's good to know you have a trusted, independent auto owner's insurance agent who's there when you need them. Great. Man, I gotta get one of those. Auto Owner's Insurance. The no problem people. See your insurance, your auto owner's agent at 904 Bellevue Avenue in Dublin or call 272-0915. We know pools. Mid-state pools and spas knows pools. In-ground pools, above-ground pools, spas, patio furniture, pool supplies. With over 34 years of experience behind every product we sell. And over 1,500 pools installed. And Mid-state pools builds all our own pools, never subcontracting the work out. Count on Mid-State Pools and Spas, state licensed and insured, and offering weekly maintenance, liner replacements with a 20-year warranty, and pool renovations available. Now's the time to call Mid-State Pools and Spas, because we know pools. Check out our wonderful selection of telescope casual pool furniture, made in the USA. And remember, we know pools at Mid-State Pools and Spas. Call us today at 1-800-284-0506 or 275-0506. Now's the time to call Mid-State Pools and Spas because we know pools. It is now time for our closing statements. 25 years ago, we have a president of Ronald Reagan and Johnny Cash and Bob Holtz. Today, we have a president of Ronald Obama with John Merrill. No cash, no And boldly stay at us, restore the promise of the American dream by 
protecting and defending Constitution of the United States of America, securing the blessing of our liberty with a strong military and secure border, putting the power back in the, the hands of the people, we the people, to govern of themselves, unleashing the free market to develop some physically responsible solutions, education, energy, and health care, and most importantly, bring back the millions of blue-collar and high-tech business from abroad. In my heart, I know that America's best days are still ahead of her. Before you ask them, I want to serve the great state of Georgia and 12th District as your next United States Congressman. With your help and by God's divine grace, we will restore the promise of America. Thank you. I may look a little different than you, and I talk a little different than you, and I have a little different accent, but I am saying American like you, and I love Georgia like you. Both for you, for you. Washington in the U-turn. I'm the only person can beat the John Barrow. Once for all. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Thank you all for listening. I feel privileged to have been a candidate. I think it should be required of every American citizen to run. Nobody works harder for change in this country than the candidate. That's what I found in 2010. I didn't run in 2012 and I felt guilty. So I'm back running now. I think any one of us loves this country. Any one of us will follow the Constitution of the United States. We have a government now that's going the other way. They are following the Communist Manifesto. And if you don't believe me, pick up my book and take it home and look at it for yourself. If there's one reason, one good reason I think to impeach, that would be it. And I want to see Nancy Pelosi impeach. I want to see Barack Obama impeach, and I want to see Harry B. impeach. Now, the easy way to keep them out of power is to make sure that the Senate goes our way. And also keep the House in the Republican side. We do have some Republicans that need to be retired soon, but we definitely need to take care of that Democrat leadership. ASAP, as soon as possible, instead. Thank you very much. Plans, ledges, and platitudes. That's what's called the first time for all of us up here. I think we're all equal on the platitudes and the fact that our country's going in the wrong direction. It has to be changed. Our district's going in the wrong direction. It has to be changed. And we have to win back our seat from John Barrow. But this election, this primary, is not about John Barrow. His name is not going to be on the ballot when you go out early vote on April 28th. It's going to be the five of us. And here's the choice you have to make. This party has got to change. This election, this primary election, is about the heart and soul of the Republican Party. Are we going to be a party that has a voice vote on the floor like we did last week? in which we raised spending and added on to Obamacare without a single member being required to put their name on that. Or are we going to have a party that will stand up to the Constitution, the rule of law, conservative principles, and be the kind of party we can be proud of again? If we're going to do that, we've got to have new leadership. It won't do us a bit of good to win this seat back to John Barrow and have that same crowd in control up there in which they came into the Obama administration on every issue of the rule of law. We've got to have new leaders. That's why I took the hard step last September and said, I will vote for new leadership in the House. Now, if you're not willing to make that pledge, what you're doing is you're leaving your options open. You're talking platitudes, but you're not giving any specifics, no plans, no pledges. You're leaving your options open. We can't afford to leave our options open anymore. We have to take back our party, and until we take back our party, we can't move this country forward. We simply have to do it. We have young, dynamic, true conservative Republican leadership in the wings, waiting to move forward into the Speaker's chair and the Whip's chair, and we've got to have new members of Congress willing to stand up and make it happen and fight for our Constitution. 
Thank you, Mr. Stone. Just that. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we haven't had much of the faith. I think that we all agree with what God has done. And I'm never inspired to be a, an elected official in my life, but I have been devoted for the last four years to doing what I believe was right. And I have a, a proven conservative record, a constitutional record, of, of serving the people that elected me for the last four years. I also have an example of challenging leadership, whether it's specific issues like water rights or ethics reform uh, or, or uh, many other issues that, you know, healthcare exchanges that we face in our freshman year. Not to mention challenging four positions of leadership. And because I took that challenge, because I knew what was right, and I communicated and tried to win the hearts and minds of others to, to do what was right, we now have new leadership in the House. Uh, Representative Matt Hatchett is now serving as our caucus chair because of that effort. And I'll tell you that we're, we're sound in the state legislature with a movement that's happening right now because of committed men and women doing what they do is right. Not playing politics, but voting their principles and following the conditions. And I truly believe that I'm in this race if you'll take the time to look, to give the example of that commitment and that record to match up against John Barrow in November. And I'm the only candidate in this race that has the ability to show you who I am and who I will be, not tell you what I will do. So please take the time to research each one of us, lift our names up specifically in prayer, and make sure that we bring this thing together on the other side of the primary because we have to remove John Barrow as the representative of this district. Thank you. On May 20th, you're going to hire your congressman. And I agree, you need to look at each one of us. I have not served in elected office. One of the things I love about Charlie Norwood and one of the reasons I supported him when he came in. When I was in his department's general chair, he told, him, he told me, he said, I don't need your help. I said, what are you getting ready to do? He said, I want to run for Congress. And like Charlie, like the people said to me, I said to Charlie, have you lost your mind? And he said, no. He said, I'm sick and tired. And I'm mad. And something's got to be done. He shut down his dental practice. That was a tremendous sacrifice. And that's why I supported Charlie. And that's why the Norwood family, I'm pleased to say that the Norwood family has endorsed our candidates this year. And we talk about leadership. You know, right now, we've got self-preserving or self-preservation leadership in Washington. That's a problem. You need to look at what we've been involved in. I've been in the private sector, and we talk about the private sector here a lot tonight. I've been in the private sector, folks, for 37 years. My wife and I took our savings. We were 25 years old and started a small business. And we're still here today. In fact, that business, despite this horrible economy, is doing okay. But it could show you a lot better if we could get Washington out of the way. I served on the hospital board. I know a lot about health care. I was chairman of the hospital board for nine years. I worked with doctors. A group of us started a bank. I've gone through that the last few years in the banking industry. I know the problems of the banking industry, and I know what it's going to take to get this economy going. We've got to get the banks blowing money again to small business people. Small business creates 6% of the jobs in this country. We have got to get back to faith, family, and freedom. Thank you very much.